Revelation chapter 2, the synagogue of Satan. That's where we're headed today. Sit tight. We will be right back. Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of a Rabbi Cross-Examines the New Testament with our lovely and wonderful Rabbi Michael, the man Skobak. Welcome back. It is always a delight and a pleasure to see you, sir. How are you today? <laughs> it is awesome to be with you, as always. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're going to start Chapter 2. And as I mentioned last week, when we began the book of Revelation, it's a very difficult book. And uh, I find quite a bit of what we encounter here puzzling. Um, so in chapters two and three, what we're going to encounter basically is that John is, or the author, whoever it is, the, ostensibly John is directed to write these letters to six basic to, to six churches either that were in existence at the time or some commentaries say that will be coming into existence in any event what we're going to see are six messages to six different churches and what i mentioned last week i found difficult to understand is that even though ostensibly this is a revelation from Jesus to John, but it's not given directly by Jesus to John. Apparently, what we're told in chapter one is that Jesus has an angel reveal this to John. I just don't understand why. That's not normally what happens in the Christian Bible. And in chapter two here, what we see is that when John basically writes these letters, He's directed to write the letters to the angels of the churches, not directly to the churches. And again, I just I'm not quite sure what to make of this, why Jesus reveals these ideas to John through an angel and why John is directed to communicate to various angels. I'll just leave that as a big question mark that I just I, I I'm puzzled by in any event. Um, what we begin with in chapter two is the message to the church in Ephesus, which was one of the major, major centers back then. And what's interesting is that we once again uh, run into the issue of counterfeit disciples, right? Fake teachers, false teachers. This is something that I've spoken about endlessly. And again, it, it's it seems strange to me because this is uh, even if you date this letter relatively late, like some people are, are assuming that Revelation is written in the in the 60s, 70s. Some people date it later to the 90s or even the early second century. But still, it's relatively new, meaning that that Jesus is only crucified in the year 30, approximately. So this is the infancy of Christianity, and it, it seems swamped, totally swamped by all of these false teachers and false disciples and false apostles. And, you know, it seems like it's the Wild West theologically back then. And um, it just, to me, it's surprising that the quality control on whatever Jesus started, and he may not have started anything. Um, th this whole faith may have basically sprung up somehow helter-skelter after he died, but if it was something that he tried to establish, um, the quality control was awful. I remember when I was a high school student, I, I worked at Nabisco, a Nabisco factory. Um, we had a science work-study project in my in my last year of high school. And I remember one of the departments I worked in was in the quality control department. It was ab absolutely hysterical how, you know, they were fanatics about, you know, maintaining the consistency of their products. We had these huge machines that would test uh, 
you know, the consistency of their peanut butter. Like it had to be always the same consistency. And we had a whole huge machine that would basically try to puncture their packaging material. I mean, it, they made a, an effort to make sure that the product was consistent and was of, you know, consistent quality. And this seemed to have fallen apart very quickly. In any event, what happens in verse two is that the, um, the John is directed to write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. And he says, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not and have found them false. So um, it's interesting that here I'm now sitting in my chair and I'm thinking, who might this be talking about? So from, you know, my understanding of the development of Christianity, and again, my understanding is probably much, much different than the Christians that are watching and Christians that are not watching. But my read of the development of Christianity was that Jesus had basically uh, a small following of Jews who came to believe either because he made the claim or because this is something that became evident to them, they, that they believed Jesus was the Messiah. Um, my understanding is that uh, they did not worship him. They did not pray to Jesus as God. They did not see him as God. They did not see Jesus as having replaced the observance of the Torah, that these are basically Torah observant Jews who maintained their observance of the Torah after Jesus died. They continue going to the synagogue, to the temple in Jerusalem, offering sacrifices. They did not believe that Jesus died for anyone's sins. They basically were Torah observant Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And even though he died without fulfilling any of the messianic prophecies, they believed that he would one day return and fulfill the messianic prophecies. Um, and that's what I believe was going on in the original movement, what became known as the Jerusalem church. And what I see as the first serious heresy is basically the teachings and the ministry of Paul. And I've spoken about this at great length when we went through, uh, you know, the various letters that Paul wrote and some of the letters of his Paul's disciples. Uh, I see a huge departure between Paul and um, Jesus. James Tabor, Professor Tabor, writes about this in his really important book called Paul and Jesus, which I highly recommend. And uh, you see, it's not something that, that I invented. You see this in the pages of the Christian Bible. There's tremendous tension between uh, Paul and almost everybody. He seems to be the kind of guy that, that basically attracts a lot of uh, controversy wherever he goes, but there seems to have been tension between Paul and the Jerusalem church, between the original disciples. And uh, I'm not going to rehearse all of the differences and problems we've discussed in the past. The main one, however, was the issue of Torah observance. Paul seems to essentially, even for Jews, um, negate the binding nature, eternal binding nature of all the laws of the Torah. And Paul seems to be the primary source for the messianic makeover, this idea that Jesus fulfilled the main mission of the Messiah, which Paul, I believe, essentially uh, develops, which is that he dies as a sacrifice to atone for the sins of the world. And, uh, you know, these are major departures. So when I think of someone who is claiming to be a disciple, but they're not, that Paul is the one that comes to mind for me. And I don't know if, I know there's someone that keeps on commenting in our uh, 
uh, in the comments to these programs, that's his perspective. If it's a man, I don't know if it's a man or a woman, but whatever it is, there's someone who I think he identifies as some kind of an early Nazarene or something. Um, but he basically takes this position that, um, you know, all of these letters are essentially attacks against the heresy of Paul and Paul's departure from the original true uh, path that was set by Jesus. So that's who comes to mind for me when I see this letter to the churches in Ephesus and being, you know, and, and speaking about the, the those that are basically calling themselves apostles or disciples, but they're not. And I would say that Paul was someone who he claims I mean, that Jesus appointed 12 apostles and Paul comes along and says, no, he appointed me as well. Right. He just makes this claim, even though Paul never met Jesus. Paul claims that Jesus appeared to him in personal visions and that Jesus appointed him as the apostle to the Gentiles. So I would say that this is, you know, clearly possibly referencing Paul. Um, but what you really find, I guess, by the editors of the Christian Bible is that Paul is not the um, the villain here. Paul basically is put in line with this message against the anti-Pauline uh, disciples. So, for example, in the book of Acts, chapter 20, you have Paul, because, again, you know, after a about chapter 11, the whole book of Acts really becomes a, a book about Paul. Um, so in chapter 20, verses 29 to 31, so what does Paul say here? Paul says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. And if I remember correctly, this chapter, um, I believe that he was speaking to the church in Ephesus at that point. I may be wrong. Um, yeah, it's his farewell to the Ephesian elders. So, um, that's how Christians normally understand this, this reference to the false disciples and false apostles um, in, in, in verse 2 here. Now, what's interesting is that as you go through chapters 2 and 3, the general pattern is that the message that John is directed to give is to start off by pointing out what these churches uh, do that is positive and and good, but then goes on to chastise them. I think except for the Church of Philadelphia, I think and we'll see next week, but I, I think to the Church of Philadelphia, they, they didn't find too much negativity. But in any event, what happens in, in verses four and five is that the writer here, or John, begins to lay into the Church of Ephesus, or again, this letter apparently is going to the angel of the Church of Ephesus. So he says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. So most of the commentaries seem to believe that the accusation here is that the Ephesian church has become lukewarm They've become loveless, they've lost their passion, and they basically are chastised for this. Now, one thing that I really think is important to notice here in, in Revelation is that we rarely encounter this in the Christian Bible, meaning that what you're going to be having here are basically uh, reprimands, reproof against these churches. And this is pretty rare because in the Christian Bible, invariably, the attacks are directed against outsiders. 
um, you know, all of the, you know, enemies of the church, all the enemies of the faith, all of the heretics, all of the false teachers, all the false disciples and the false apostles. Uh, it is very rarely, if I remember correctly, once in a while, but, you know, it's very different from the Tanakh. In the Tanakh, the prophets were not sent to flatter Israel. You know, when, when you go to a gym and you hire a personal trainer, you're not hiring the personal trainer to compliment you and tell you how great you look and <laughs> how wonderful you are. You basically, you, you're, you're hoping your trainer is going to point out what you're doing wrong and how you need to improve. So the prophets in the Tanakh basically came to beat up Israel. They didn't come to compliment them and flatter them. That was their main job, the main job of the prophets. They had another side job, which was to encourage the Jewish people that over the course of their difficult history, the prophets did come to tell them that one day things will get better. The world is going to get repaired. There's going to be a utopian messianic age. But that's not the majority of what the prophets talk about. The majority, um, to a great extent, is uh, reproving them and berating them for their spiritual, moral, religious, ethical failures. So here is one of the only times I remember in the Christian Bible where the text laces into the churches. Um, again, I'm not saying it never happened in the past, but it seems to me that the predominance of messages is to criticize outsiders, to criticize the heretics and the non-believers. So um, that's what we're going to see in, in these two chapters, is that each of the churches, except possibly for the Church of Philadelphia, is going to be excoriated for their failures. Now, in verse 6, um, the writer, again, we're assuming it's John, praises the Church of Ephesia, Ephesus for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans, um, who Jesus hates as well. Um, it's a strong word. You don't usually want to talk about hatred, but it, it sometimes there's a place for it. And uh, the question is, who are these Nicolaitans? Because there's no clue as to what what their problem is, what the what the evil of the Nicolaitans is, just by reading the Book of Revelation. It's, there's nothing at all that that we find here. So there are various theories. I mentioned last week that I'm not going to spend a lot of time citing Christian commentaries, but I'll probably once in a while have to do that. And so one of the commentaries I'm going to refer to is uh, an unusual one. Um, I studied this many years ago. It was a entire commentary to the book of Revelation by a Christian journalist and broadcaster, Jack Van Impey. Some of you probably remember him. And uh, he was someone who apparently knew the whole Bible by heart. And uh, I found his interpretation of Revelation to be interesting. So he basically says that the um, Nicolaitans, the problem with them was that they were a religious cult in the sense that they were a dictatorship, that the church leaders uh, basically dictated what people had to do. They didn't allow for the members of the church to have any freedom whatsoever. It just sounded like a mind control cult. That's how Jack Van Impey sees the Nicolaitans. Most other Christian commentaries, um, I'm not sure why, but they sort of um, slide the Nicolaitans with what we're going to see later on tonight is the those who follow the teachings of Bilaam. So um, people like David Stern and John MacArthur and their commentaries see the Nicolaitans as a heretical sect. Again, it's again one of these, you know, distortions, which, you know, there is so many of them, but it's they're not a heretical sect of Judaism. They're a heretical sect of the church that encouraged idolatry of all things and sexual sin and sexual deviancy. So that's how they see these Nicolaitans. And of course, you don't want them to be 
uh, you know, <laughs> having any place in the church. And uh, what's interesting, if we go to verse 7, now I'm reading from now, I, I should get a bigger Bible, but I'm reading from the New International Version. Um, this is in verse 7. So the writer says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So obviously it's probably not referring to the actual Eitachayim, the tree of life in the actual Garden of Eden. First of all, we know that God put angels to protect that tree, that it shouldn't be eaten, but it's probably more of a metaphor here. Um, some see this as a, as a metaphor. Eating from the tree of life means that you will gain immortality. In the Torah itself, especially in the book of Proverbs, the tree of life is associated with Torah wisdom. Um, we say about the Torah, the Torah is a tree of life. In any event, what I wanted to point out was that this verse is to me another indication that, that Jesus is not seen as God. Why do I say that? Because again, they believe that this message is coming from Jesus. This is a revelation from Jesus. And Jesus says, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He doesn't say in my paradise. He again, distinguishes himself by this language from God. Obviously, the writer, if the writer is referring to the tree of life in the paradise of God, the writer is not God, right? Otherwise, the writer would have said, in my paradise. So I think, this again, this is another verse of the hundreds and hundreds that we've seen where Jesus is distinguished from God. Now, in verse 8, we move to the church in Smyrna. Uh, the next church, and we're going to read now from verse, let's say, 9, where the angel says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, we're going to come across this expression again next week in chapter three, but this is a very curious expression. Um, people who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So interestingly, how is this understood? So the vast majority, probably even almost all Christian commentaries understand for example, John MacArthur, you know, one of your more popular Protestant commentaries to the Christian Bible, understands this to be referring to actual Jews who reject Jesus. And because they don't, re they don't accept Jesus, even though they say they're Jews, so the Christian Bible here is saying, so you see, they're not really Jews that a Jew cannot, by definition, reject Jesus. And this is consistent, this idea that these people who say they're Jews, but they're not really Jews. So this is taught throughout the Christian Bible that a real Jew is not someone who's born to a Jewish mother, for example, which would be the definition of a Jew in Jewish thought. Um, but the idea is that if you are a real Jew, by definition, you have to accept the Jewish Messiah. You see this, for example, in Paul's writings in Romans chapter two, verses 28 to 29. So what does Paul say here? Paul says, a man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, 
not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. So what almost all Christians understand this reference to those who say they are Jews, but they're not, it's referring to people who actually are Jews, meaning that they are part of the Jewish community, but the book of Revelation is saying, but they're not really Jews, right? Meaning that as far as the Christian Bible is concerned, whatever status they had of Jews, they lose. They lose it because they do not believe in Jesus. Now, David Stern, as you can imagine, bristles at this interpretation. And he says, no, he says, for sure, that's not what it means. It's not speaking about actual Jews who are now being stripped of their Jewish status because of their failure to believe in Jesus. He says that, take it at, take it at face value. They claim to be Jews, but they're not. Meaning, according to David Stern, these are non-Jews. These are Gentiles pretending to be Jews. That's who it's talking about according to David Stern. And he says it's similar to the Judaizers that you find being uh, spoken about in the book of Galatians. And um, these, are, these are people that try to get other Gentile Christians to keep the Torah. Um, and, and David Stern, and I would also parallel this to the numerous Gentile groups and individuals today claiming to be Jews. Um, you know, I, I used to go, I mean, I, I, I may return, but I used to go almost every year to the major messianic conferences here in North America. And every year I would meet many people claiming to be Jews, and they weren't in any shape, way, shape, or form. Now, in their mind, they probably saw themselves as spiritual Jews, as grafted in, so to speak. But they, they would not be accepted in the Jewish community as people who are, their status is of being Jews. And that's who David Stern says this is referring to. Those Gentiles, those non-Jews, claiming to be Jews, but they're not. And that's really the simple meaning of the verse. That's the simplest way of reading it. And what's interesting is David Stern is really left scratching his head. If, if the meaning of this passage is so clear, so how is it possible that virtually all Christian commentaries misunderstand it? And they say, no, this is talking about actual Jews who, you know, are, we're being told now, but they're not really Jews because they don't believe in Jesus. So he um, says the following, and it's very, this is a very interesting statement that he makes. He says that the only explanation I can see for this is the anti-Jewish mindset that has infected the church. And he calls it as he sees it. And he says that he sees this passage in the second chapter of Revelation, he sees this as blatantly anti-Jewish. And uh, he says the only way that, that Christians for centuries have been able to misread this passage is they come to the text with an anti-Jewish bias. And he brings, and I think this is a very strong and compelling proof, he brings as proof to his reading verse 2. Now, if you go back to verse 2, it speaks about there those who say they are disciples, but they're not. They're liars. So there, in that passage, right, when it speaks about those who say they're disciples, but they're not, so no one assumes that they were actually disciples and, you know, but because they're bad guys, we're saying they're not really disciples. No one reads verse two and says it's speaking about actual disciples. It's speaking about people who are not disciples and they're calling themselves disciples. So Stern says, you see, there's a parallel between verse two and verse nine. Verse two is talking about those who say they are disciples and they're not, they're liars. They're lying. They're not, they were never disciples. And so too, verse nine, 
where you have people claiming to be Jews, but they're not, it's exactly what it means. They were never Jews. They're simply claiming to have been Jews. And it's interesting that this has been, apparently, it's not just a contemporary phenomenon where you have, you have plenty of groups today. I mean, just do a little bit of research. You know, the Mormons claim to be the 10 tribes, the lost 10 tribes of Israel. You have a lot of the black Hebrews. I remember once when I was living in Brooklyn, uh, one of the black Hebrews chased me for a few blocks. He was saying that, that I'm not a Jew. I'm Edom, Edom. He said to me, you're Edom, right? He said he's an Israelite. I'm an Edomite. So there are plenty of people today uh, not just one or two groups, plenty of groups that claim to be the real Jews. And, uh, you know, those of us, uh, you know, who are members of this small Jewish community, we're not real Jews. We're the fakers. Um, OK, so let's move on. Um, in verse 13, it speaks about Satan's throne, the throne of Satan. Obviously, when you speak about the throne of Satan, you know, the only imagery of a throne is you put a king on a throne. And we know that in the Gospel of John, it speaks about Satan as the god of this world. You basically have in the Christian Bible, unfortunately, a very distorted view of Satan. Satan is seen as the leader of a movement against God, as someone on an opposing team, so to speak, an opposing team. Um, someone who, according to Christian thought, rebelled against God, right, uh, was cast down from heaven and, uh, you know, took a whole bunch of angels with him. But basically, Satan is seen as a rebellious angel and someone who is uh, essentially leading a coup, trying to lead a coup against God. And so the imagery here is that Satan, as a leader of this demonic movement has a throne. He's like a king. Obviously, this is very different than the traditional Jewish concept of Satan. Satan in Jewish thought is always seen as basically an agent of God, a messenger of God, as subservient and answerable to God, as under the control of God. And another difference is that in Christian thought, Satan is 100% negative. There's nothing good and redeeming about Satan at all. In Jewish thought, Satan actually is seen in a very positive way. When in the book of Genesis, it says after each day of creation, and God saw that it was good, and at the end of the entire creation story, it says God saw that it was very good. So the Midrash says very good, that refers to Satan meaning that Satan is, in some ways, one of the greatest blessings God ever gave the world. Why is that? Because without this loyal opposition, in a sense, right? Satan was sent by God on a mission to obstruct human progress in a spiritual way, meaning that the word Satan in Hebrew means obstacle or obstruction. And that's the whole purpose of Satan to challenge people to be what we call in English an inner adversary, the, because the reality is that the satanic force is primarily internal. It works within us, but it's an inner adversary that tries to impede our spiritual growth. And that's for a positive reason, meaning that you now gain virtue by overcoming this force. You're able to grow by overcoming these challenges. If you went through life and there were never any challenges and it was easy to be good, it was easy to choose the right thing, there'd be no virtue in doing those things. The fact is that we live in a world and our reality is that we are challenged when we are faced with uh, choices of either doing what God would have us do, or choosing the alternative, which is often very attractive. Um, you know, we might in the morning have a thought, maybe from our Yetzer Hatov, our good inclination, that, you know, this is a good thing for me to do. 
uh, get up early now and go and pray, go and study Torah. Um, we have another side of us which says, nah, it's cold outside, you're tired, go sleep some more, right? <laughs> so you have this struggle. It's a struggle in life. And if there was no struggle, right, if, if everyone just jumped out of bed in the morning automatically, like you couldn't stand being in that bed, there'd be very little virtue in dragging yourself out of bed and, you know, going to study for an hour or two or going to pray for an hour or two. Um, anything that we do in life that is virtuous has uh, an opposing force that makes it hard for us to do that. It's not easy for people to give away their money to charity. There's a side of us, an internal voice, which says, you need it for yourself. What are you giving it away for? Everything challenges us. And so we see Satan in a positive light because we now, through overcoming this force in the world, are able to gain merit. Now, again, this flies in the face of all of Christian thought. In Christian thought, you can't gain merit by what you do. You are basically seen as useless and as a sinner, and you, can do, you can't do anything that's pleasing to God. But in Jewish thought, we believe the opposite, that it's possible to live a virtuous life, a righteous life, and you can gain merit by doing that which is good and right. And we gain merit because it's difficult, because there are opposing forces. That's the job of the satanic force, to give us the opportunity to gain merit. So we have many differences between the way Satan is seen in the Christian mindset and the way Satan is seen in the Jewish mindset. Um, in verse 14, he now is speaking of the church of Pergamum, and he's claiming that there is some in that church that hold to the teaching of Bilaam. So again, we know what Bilaam was up to. He was originally hired by um, Balak to curse the Jewish people. That didn't work out because every curse that he was trying to give turned into a blessing. But then he came up with a brilliant plan, which, to, which was to entice the Jews to idolatry through basically arranging these orgies for them. And uh, that unfortunately worked. We see that in the book of Numbers, chapter 25, in the beginning of that chapter. Um, okay. Um, moving on, in verse 16, he says to this church, repent or I'm coming to you quickly. Now, this got me thinking about one of the comments in the uh, comment section to the video last week, where I had spoken about the idea that in the book of Revelation, Jesus is basically supposedly saying he's coming soon. He's coming soon. And uh, one of the comments was, you know, that Skoback, you don't understand the New Testament because in the eyes of God, one day is like a thousand years. So the fact that Jesus has not yet come back in 2000 years is not a violation of this statement that I'm coming back soon. Now, I, I, <laughs> I, I wrote back to the person and I said, the problem is that, you know, Jesus here is allegedly not speaking to God. It's not telling God I'm coming back and, you know, soon. And God would understand that soon, you know, could mean thousands of years. He's writing to a church, human beings, that in their frame of reference, it's true, maybe in the eyes of God, a day is like a thousand years. But to human beings, it's not. And to human beings, when you say soon, what it means is soon. It doesn't mean in thousands of years. Um, but it's interesting that here, uh, Jesus is allegedly saying, repent or I'm coming to you quickly. So does this mean that if they don't repent, according to the the person I, I interacted with last week. So if they don't repent, does quickly mean that he'll be back in thousands of years to punish them? Obviously, that's meaningless, right? Meaning that if you're talking to a group of people and you tell them, repent or I'm coming to you quickly, for that threat to have any kind of meaning, it has to mean that they're the ones that are going to feel the repercussions of not repenting. 
So when he says, I'm going to come to you quickly, it means you're going to get it quickly, meaning that pretty soon. And if the writer that I interacted with is correct and I'm coming to you quickly means I'm coming to you in thousands of years, these people are going to be long dead in thousands of years. So the warning to this church is just meaningless if you have that kind of understanding of scripture, of the, of the verses. Um, in verse 17, he speaks about giving them some of the, giving him some of the hidden manna. It's not clear what the hidden manna is. Um, Jack Van Impey in his commentary says it's the word of God. I guess you have to take the idea of manna symbolically. Um, and then it speaks about a white stone that you'll be given. So Van Impey says that a white stone back then symbolized acquittal in court. Um, David Stern says that um, white stones were an admission ticket to public events back then, to public festivals. And so it means that if you get the white stone, that true believers in Jesus will be admitted to the messianic feast that will be held in the future. Um, again, these are passages which use clearly symbolic language. It's not simple to understand what is meant. Now, in verse 18, we have uh, sort of a, a, an echo of what we read last week in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, where it speaks about the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze. And I pointed out last week that these are images that are lifted directly from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 9. And as I mentioned last week, basically what we see throughout the Christian Bible is that the images, the language, the stories, the references are all basically lifted from the palette of the Hebrew scriptures of the Tanakh. And the truth is, it's not just in the Greek scriptures, the Christian Bible, where, you know, they use the Tanakh basically as the building blocks of their scriptures, meaning that the Tanakh provides the material from which, uh, through which the Christian Bible is essentially written. And you see the same thing more or less with the Book of Mormon and with the Quran even. I mean, it's just interesting that the Hebrew scriptures became the foundation and the, the, the source, really, for the construction of all these, what Jews would call post-biblical documents. Um, now, in verse 23, I'm a little bit confused about verse 23. If Jesus is speaking here, this would be one of the few places, I think, in the Christian Bible where Jesus is, seems to be portrayed as divine. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure what to make of this because again, it doesn't um, flow uh, consistently with everything I've seen before. The, again, if Jesus is speaking and he says, I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I'll repay each of you according to your deeds. That, that, that sounds like the kind of thing God would say. And they have Jesus saying it, so I don't know what to make of that. I'll have to just leave that as a bit of a question mark. In verse 25, now we're writing, by the way, to a new church. This is to the church in Thyatira. That's how you pronounce it. He writes to them in verse 25, only hold on to what you have until I come. Hold fast until I come. Again, apparently, the expectation was that he would come in that generation that's being addressed. Otherwise, you know, how long can they hold on? I mean, this church, you know, the people are going to, you know, reach the ripe age of 70, 80, and then most of them are not going to be around anymore. So it, again, it seems that the expectation, at least apparently, is that whatever is supposed to happen is going to happen in that generation. Now, in verse 26, 
the writer, or again, John here speaking on behalf of Jesus or through the angel of Jesus, to those who keep my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Um, this seems to be based upon their understanding, at least, of Psalm chapter 2, um, where in chap chapter 2 of Psalms, David is given authority, but, you know, Christians do see it as a, a sort of a type forecasting Jesus. Um, but it's interesting that in the Christian Bible, uh, you hear Jesus speaking in these words that he's going to give authority to his disciples, right? Because again, in here in verse 26, Jesus says to those who keep my deeds, I will give authority over the nations. So if you go back to Matthew, we did this. A, I mean, how many years ago was this, William? Six years ago, seven years ago when we started Matthew. So in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, um, so it, Jesus says, on the generation when the Son of Man sits on the throne, on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So in Matthew, the fo followers of Jesus will be given authority and be judges over the 12 tribes of Israel. Here in Revelation, it seems to be expanded that they're given authority over the nations, not just over Israel. And it seems that that's also what you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, where it says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? So it seems to, the, to have gone through an expansion. Originally, the followers of Jesus were given, were, were promised um, authority over the 12 tribes. It could be, I mean, I'm just speculating now, that again, in the Gospels, the focus of Jesus is not universal. In the, in the Gospels, Jesus is only there for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the focus on the rest of the world doesn't come until after the crucifixion of Jesus, where the allegedly post-resurrected post -resurrected Jesus gives now the um, mandate to go and evangelize the whole world. Um, so that could be what happens, that initially what you see in Matthew, it's focused only on Israel. And then uh, in Corinthians and Revelation, it's expanded to the saints and the believers in Jesus judging and having authority over the nations of the world. Um, in verse 27, you see again another example of the writer of Revelation just lifting words, lifting phrases from the Tanakh. He writes here in verse 27, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I have also received authority from my father. That's basically lifted from the book of Psalms, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And one last verse I'd like to just speak about for a moment. We'll get to this later on, but in verse 28 here, towards the end of the chapter, um, I will give him the morning star. I will give him the morning star. So later on in chapter 22 of Revelation in verse 16, we're going to see that the morning star is identified as Jesus. But it's interesting that the way Christians understand the Tanakh is that in the book of Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 the morning star is seen as satan now jews don't see isaiah 14 or ezekiel 28 as speaking about satan we understand it as this as the scriptures themselves say there uh as a basically a rant against the king of tyre but christians understand it as speaking of satan and in isaiah uh, the morning star is Satan. So it's interesting that you have two different addresses for this morning star, either Jesus or Satan. We'll see a little bit more about this when we get to chapter 22 in Revelation. So, uh, Habibi, that's all I had to share in chapter 2. And uh, God willing, we'll meet again next week.
Well, that sounds like a plan. Very, very awesome. Shalom, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. For the record, today's date is August 29th. I am super excited about the way things are going. I'm running Tanakh Talk full-time now, Baruch Hashem. November will mark eight years. It's hard to believe we've been around that long. I just finished creating the new schedule template, which will account for three shows a day, maybe even four. This will be later on down the road, of course. Sundays, however, will only have one show. That is set aside for Rabbi Tovia Singer. Monday morning, 8.30, Rabbi Michael Skobach. And I will eventually fill that same time. 8.39, one show in the morning, three shows in the afternoon slash evening time. 3 p.m., 5 p.m., and 7 p.m. Central. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel full time by going to the website, tanaktalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. You can also go to PayPal, search for T-E-N-A-K-T-A-L-K at Gmail. I also have a Patreon, patreon.com forward slash T-E-N-A-K-T-A-L-K. And of course, if you prefer snail mail, P.O. Box 1444, Kingsland, Texas 78639. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shave.